Welcome everybody. I'm Jenny Anderson and I live in the beautiful Niagara region. I'm so happy to share a few of my travel experiences with you all, hopefully to inform you as well as entertain you. My husband Trevor and I share a love of travel and thanks to his job and mine, we have managed to see a lot of this beautiful and amazing world. It all began on our honeymoon, when we traveled by train through the awesome snow-capped Rocky Mountains for the first time. We rode out on beautiful Emerald Lake in a small boat, absolute rookies. After a bit of rowing got us well away from the shore, Trevor decided he would turn around and face me. As he stood up in the boat, the boat capsized and we were floundering in the water, trying to hang on to some part of the boat while my first concern was my purse that was floating away out of reach with all our holiday cash in it. Help came very fast and we were soon rescued, complete with purse and we dried out in a kind person's bait shop. Emerald Lake, you see on the left, was pictured on the Canadian $2 note. I kept one as a souvenir when they were taken out of circulation. On our silver wedding anniversary, our daughters gave us a framed picture of Emerald Lake. Now it has been 50 years. I should have called this talk around the world in 50 years. We used to do a family vacation every year. And I remember the first one was to Colorado with its picturesque mountains, gorges and rivers. We experienced the thrill of white water rafting in class six rapids, pretty rough, on the Colorado River, rushing through deep gorges where the steep rugged rock faces rose high above us on either side. In the town of Boulder, just north of Denver, evening brings out the buskers and street performers. Much like the boardwalk in old Quebec City, where a street entertainer set up to perform every few yards, could be a fire eater or a juggler or an acrobat. One of these performers on the street in Boulder was the zip code guy. He asks his audience to call out a zip code and he promptly names the street and city to which it belongs. People try to stump him by calling out international zip codes, but he never hesitates. Rome, Nairobi, London, he knew them all. So Trevor and I thought we would throw him a curve. Trevor called out a Calcutta zip code. And he replied, Namaste, is it monsoon season in Calcutta? I gave him L2R5M9, which is the corner of Welland Avenue and George Street here in St. Catharines. He says, is that bicycle repair shop still around the corner in St. Catharines? We were so captivated by him and we considered bringing him home to perform at our Christmas socials. The Yukon and Northwest Territories, Canada's great north, have so much to offer in breathtaking scenery and gold mining history. Dawson City sal Saloons, the pubs, serve the outrageous drink called the Sour Toe. It takes courage for a newcomer to order one. It's a whiskey that has a pickled human toe in it. Bottoms up and then return the glass with the toe left in it, which is then used for the next stalwart drinker. In Alaska, the Great North lies Denali National Park, the largest national park in the world home to the grizzlies and black bears, 
wolves, caribou, moose. There lies a small town called Chicken. The story goes that it was overrun with ptarmigan birds at one time, and the people wanted to call it ptarmigan, Alaska. However, they had a little bit of trouble spelling ptarmigan, so they named the town Chicken. The train ride through the mountain passes is a must, as the scenery is really awesome. As the train reaches a certain point, the rails divide in two, and two trains may pass each other, going in opposite directions. Our guide was out for fun and told all of us in our bogey to give the other train passengers the moose salute as they passed us. We got ready, and as soon as the other train came by, scores of fingers wriggled out the windows with grinning faces. The first lot that passed us recoiled in surprise. They really were taken aback. But the bogey that followed it had been prepared by their guide and we were given the moose salute by a sea of smiling Japanese faces. In Fairbanks, my dream of seeing the Aurora Borealis came true. The breathtaking Northern lights dancing across the sky filled me with joy. Imagine floating in a steamy mineral hot spring and looking up at the midnight sky, watching the display of colorful curtains of luminous lights flash in waves, just unbelievable. Heading for South America, we were enchanted by Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. This is the country of the tango, Ladies dressed in black lace shawls and sleek red dresses dance in the streets with men in tight fitting suits and black hats to tango music from their portable tape recorders. Tourists are expected to drop some change as they take photos. In Argentina, we learn some interesting history about the area known as Patagonia. Many years ago, Germany was invited to send people to live and cultivate this area in the southern part of Argentina. Many German people settled there and similar and developed the area because they found the weather and surroundings very similar to Bavaria and the Alps, so they loved it. Generations of German origin grew up there and life became akin to Germany. The houses are chalet style, restaurants called Idlewise and beer gardens nestle in alpine backdrops. Strudel and chocolate shops thrive. Oktoberfest is celebrated. Street signs are in German. And to top it all, a large St. Bernard dog strolls the streets with a brandy keg around his neck. Tourists are fascinated to encounter people with German names speaking Spanish, because these are the descendants of those first settlers. Leaving Argentina and heading to Chile by bus is a novel experience. The buses may be very old, but the service is great. The different bus companies compete with each other by offering passengers extras like blankets, boxed meals, and tea and bickies every hour. The assistant to the driver will run bingo, open and close your window if you need, and be available for any help. Further south is Cape Horn, the tip of South America. Sunsets here are gorgeous. The sun flares and ebbs and flares and ebbs as it reaches the horizon and soon disappears. Our cruise ship stopped at Ushuaia, which is the southernmost city in the world. 
it is from Ushuaia that the explorer ships head for Antarctica. As our ship sailed around the Cape, many passengers jumped into the swimming pools. And later, each one received a certificate signed by the captain, attesting that the bearer of the certificate had swum around Cape Horn. The meeting of the waters, the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Hopping across the Pacific Ocean to Australia, where Trevor worked for four years, we experienced life at almost every state. In Australia's Northern Territory lies Kakadu National Park, the second largest national park in the world. We lived in Jabiru, a small town within the park. For two years, this was our outback experience where we encountered the culture, ways of the Aboriginal people and the wilds of the crocodile. In the rainy months, all low-lying areas are flooded and the crocs can go walk about from one waterhole to another a distance away. Before the floods, the small lake in front of our house was empty, had no crocs in it. After the floods, it had a new resident. A bridge over a river collapsed in the rains and had to be repaired. The workmen had to be lowered into the water in a cage for their protection as they worked, while a 10 foot croc named Hannibal would swim up to the cage with curious beady eyes. In Northern Queensland, we saw the stunning Great Barrier Reef up close from an underwater sub, which cruises slowly through the colorful coral gardens. In the Kuranda rainforest, the sky rail glides meters above the jungle canopy amidst orchids and other flowers that grow at the canopy top, seeking the sun. North of Australia, lie the most beautiful islands of the South Pacific. Vanuatu, the Society Islands of Bora Bora, Tahiti and Christmas Island. Their coral reefs, lagoons, mountains and atolls are gorgeous and romantic. A very interesting fact in some of these islands is that the natives speak Pidgin English. Pidgin is a simplified language that develops as a mean of communication between two or more groups who do not share a common language. See if you can interpret these phrases. A basket for titties is a bra. Mix, mix master blong Jesus is a helicopter. Mary blong me means Mary's my wife. Ed Blong's Mary is Mary is Ed's wife. Konnichiwa, hello, how are you? This really means literally, are you healthy today? I hope you all are healthy today, Konnichiwa. Japan is the land of Mount Fuji and geishas. It's a small country with a very large population, and this is evident in the capital city of Tokyo. This picture is of the cherry blossoms that Japan is well known for. There is an intersection in Ginza where five main streets converge at one point. The traffic lights at the center are synchronized so that the pedestrians on all five or six streets cross the intersection at the very same time. You must watch this from an upper floor as this photo was taken uh, in order to get the aerial view of thousands of people crisscrossing this intersection together in five or six different ways. 
We also rode the famous bullet train that traveled at 300 kilometers per hour. The people of Japan are known for their gentleness and graciousness and greeting with a bow. The deeper the bow, the more respect to the other person. What we saw at the airport was a perfect example. We watched through the departure lounge window while aircrafts were preparing for takeoff at Tokyo airport. We saw the mechanics and the ground crew wave their flags and signals till the plane was ready to take off. Then they all came together, formed a line beside the departing plane and bent low in farewell till it taxied away. Then they all ran back to prepare the next aircraft for takeoff. China is both historical and modern. We cruised on the Yangtze River, walked in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, and saw the temples and palaces of long gone dynasties. The Great Wall is the only structure that can be seen from the moon. The, pe the people are reserved, yet curious and friendly with foreigners. The Chinese form of hello or good day is translated as, have you had your breakfast? Or have you had your lunch or dinner? Depending on the time of day. A toilet is called the happy room. Their English signboards are a source of amusement to tourists. At a temple, we were warned to be silent as the sign said, temple, no louding. Outside a public washroom, hygiene was advised by a sign that said, timely rinse before using. In Shanghai, we experienced the very modern maglev train. Based on magnetic levitation, the train hovers above the rails and runs at speeds of 430 kilometers per hour. We did an eight minute trip and it was thrilling to see the monitor display the increase of speed as it reached the maximum, while the country outside the window was a blur. On a boat ride down a river, our guide pointed out an unusual and eerie sight. Looking way up, we saw hanging coffins tucked into caves along a 330 foot high cliff. Hanging coffins on cliffs was an ancient burial custom practiced in South China 2,500 years ago. Down to the equator and to beautiful Singapore, an island country, flower boxes of frangipani and bougainvillea line the avenues in brilliant color. Flowers and creepers hang down from overpasses, creating picture perfect scenes. The main avenue in the city doubles as an aircraft runway. In a national emergency, the flower beds are removed by the army in minutes. This picture is the Singapore hawker market and on the right, Singapore by night. Singapore certainly goes out, goes all out to encourage tourists. The amazing airport offers, the airport terminal offers several interesting things to do that a transit passenger would actually wish for several hours of connecting time in order to enjoy everything. There are boutiques and restaurants, of course, but also a large children's play center, a small but very interesting science center, a cinema, a virtual studio, gardens, comfy day rooms to rest, and a free two hour tour of the city. Burma, it's now called Myanmar. It opened to tourism a few years ago. These pictures will give you a brief overview. It's called the land of the golden pagodas. This is the common transport, public transport shared by many. They are 
friendly, hardworking people. If you notice their faces, they have, their faces are smeared with a lotion made from tree bark to protect from the sun and also for a healthy skin. These are the food stalls in the street. These are the monks heading to their monastery for their one meal of the day. It's usually at 12 o'clock. See, they're carrying their rice and that's probably all they'll have with maybe a pickle. On the right are young monks. They are using fans to protect their eyes from seeing evil things. Now we go to a, have a fish pedicure. Tiny toothless carp nibble away dead calloused skin from the feet of salon customers. Next to India, the land of my birth. On my last visit to Calcutta, memories of my childhood met me everywhere I went. It happened to be the monsoon season when the rains are constant and streets flood fast. My friend and I were heading to a theater show and taxis could not ply the flooded streets. The only transport was the rickshaw. The rickshaw puller made sure his price was negotiated before we got on. Bargaining is a way of life here. And so my friend, a local, bargains the price. The man stood firm on his fare and told us, if I don't take you, you will need a new pair of shoes and that will cost you 60 rupees or more. So better to pay me the same. So we climbed on board and the man pulled us along through the flooded street with the water level halfway up the wheels. A tarpaulin draped around us from the top of the rickshaw coming from the top protected us from the rain. When we had safely and almost dryly deposited us at the door of the theater, we gladly paid the price, $2. The next day I went to a hairdressing salon for a shampoo and set. Because of problems with the plumbing due to the rains, the young girl washed my hair pouring water from a bucket. My bill was 50 rupees and I gave her a tip of 15 rupees, about 50 cents. She looked shocked, but very pleased. And the other girls enviously murmured, so lucky. I did a tour of South Africa with a group of travel agents and was very impressed by the Cape of Good Hope. Here you see the meeting of the waters, the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. The drive along narrow mountain roads was exciting with the blue Atlantic Ocean always in view. And when we reached the High Point Lookout, the view was breathtaking. The Indian Ocean meets the Atlantic Ocean, a meeting of the waters not visible to the eye, of course, but the very thought of it is overwhelming. I went on wildlife safaris and saw the big five, the lion, the rhino, elephant, buffalo, and leopard. Now this on the left is an odd bird that caused us many minutes of amusement. Its mating game is to strut very fast in a circle and then flop with all his feathers over him. Then he'll get up and he'll go around again and flop again. And that's, his, that's to attract the females. Uh, the elef African elephant has very large ears and that's how it's known by its large ears. I wanted to tell you something about the elephants. Uh, an elephant can die of heartbreak. It's the only animal, the only creature that actually dies of heartbreak. They are such a family 
family, a close family uh, group. I, we saw a baby elephant in a clearing fast asleep and three or four adult elephants standing around it, shielding it from the sun, the hot sun, midday sun. An unforgettable experience in the Southern Cape. Oh, may I just tell you about this before I go on to that. The, the giraffes, the giraffes will stand side by side looking in opposite directions because they are on alert for predators and basically they're watching each other's back. And that's a coalition of cheetahs. An African sunset, an unforgettable experience in the Southern Cape was when we were in a restaurant having lunch. Suddenly a very large baboon jumped in through an open window and bounded across the tables. Everyone jumped up, some screaming. Some of us were really panicked, which of course frightened the baboon, which had come in looking for bread. Ironically, the first reaction was to throw a missile, a, loaf, a, 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 bread, a bit of bread, a bread roll, sorry. The waiters drove it out with brooms, kept ready, I suppose, because they're used to this. The sound of others jumping across the tin roof was scary. We learned later that these are chakma baboons and they're, they're known as jackass baboons because they bray. There are hundreds of them in the Cape area, but they're endangered, so they must not be killed. The organization for their preservation hires vagrant and homeless people, jobless and homeless, to track them and keep them away from residential homes. The baboons have been known to enter a house and even open a fridge and kitchen cupboards looking for food. A very interesting and unique culture of people inhabit the Maasai Mara in Tanzania and Kenya. Dressed in bright colors of red, orange, and green, these nomads live across the Serengeti. The name means endless plains. Smiling and friendly, the women on the left work on handicrafts, even while cooking and tending their babies and toddlers and dancing and singing for visitors. The men, are hunters and protectors. A young man must pass certain tests to qualify as a warrior. Then the usual mating custom, high jumping. The men will jump straight up with heels far from the ground. Some have been known to jump as high as eight feet. The highest jumpers attract the brides. As our safari land cruiser drove out of the Serengeti plains, the driver pointed out a pair of mating lions and backed up as close as possible to give us a better view. In backing up, the wheels lodged on a small rocky mound and the vehicle tilted dangerously to one side. Thrown to the windows on one side, we clung on to resist sliding onto one another. The lions were just a few feet away and seemed intent on each other. Though a couple of jeeps showed up, mainly to watch the lions and to wave at us consolingly, in our predicament, actual help only arrived 20 minutes later. Another safari four-wheel drive drove up behind us and gently nudged our vehicle over the mound and it righted itself. We were on our way. Now, that was scary. We were sure we would have to transfer to the rescue Jeep in front of the lions. In Rwanda, we hiked up a mountainside to track the silverbacks. 
it was Trevor's dream to see these mountain gorillas. The male's back hair begins to get white at age 17 or 18. And when the sun shines on them, it looks silver, hence the name. The trek was the toughest thing I've ever done in my life. I had not hiked or trekked ever before. Several families of gorillas live in these mountains. Our tracker searched for the family closest to the foothills so we wouldn't have such a long trek. The gorillas roamed all day and only after they stopped at night was it possible to pin down their location. We were tracking the Sabinio family, eight members, including two silverbacks. It had rained the night before, so the gorillas came lower down the mountain to feed. That was good, so they would be closer to reach. The trail uphill was narrow and steep. We were six of us, plus the ranger and porters. We each had a porter to carry our backpacks. However, I ended up with two as I really needed the help and it became a push me, pull you to help me climb up the slopes. The trail was very muddy and soggy from the rain and this made the ascent very difficult. Shoes were sinking in the thick glop and we couldn't really walk to the side of the path as it was lined with nettle trees, which the gorillas love to eat. So with, ouch, yikes, and burning stings, it was not much of a choice. After two and a half hours, we reached those marvelous eight foot tall animals. They were six meters away, eating bamboo and nettle leaves and grunting and ambling about seemingly oblivious to us. We saw the oldest in that part of the world, a 43-year-old silverback, and two females, two 18-year-old silverbacks, a three-year-old and a baby being carried under the arm of a very protective mother. One hour with the mountain gorillas is all we are allowed as it does disrupt their routine. Even though they don't look straight at us, they are aware of humans all the time and this affects their feeding. The big guy smashed down a small tree to get at the leaves. The three-year-old sat facing us and picked his nose, licked his fingers and ate it. So childlike. At one point, the ranger whispered, move over very quietly. And we looked back to see a huge silverback lumbering down the path beside us and we were in his way. We moved aside and he continued down to join his family. Had we not moved, he would have swiped us out of his way with a giant furry paws. The atmosphere was very hazy, like gorillas in the mist the movie about Diane Fossey. Coming down took one and a half hours, sliding uncontrollably down the muddy slopes. At the end of it, we were totally covered in mud and wet to the bone. The reward? The most unique experience with those marvelous creatures and the fantastic vistas of the Twin Lakes and the volcano. We lived in Algeria in North Africa for two years when the children were five and six years old. They attended an Arabic school in the mornings when they were taught in French. I would homeschool them in the afternoons. We took a long trip down to the edge of the Sahara Desert and the children had an exciting time rolling down giant sand dunes. There in the desert, we spotted a Bedouin tent with a Mercedes Benz parked outside it. My grade seven teacher would always impress upon us to see Naples and die. The dear lady did not leave India, but I never forgot her advice. 
When in Italy, we did visit Naples and the Amalfi Coast and the Isle of Capri, and we were thrilled by the splendor of it all. From our hotel room in Sorrento, we looked straight at Mount Vesuvius. Days later, we were in Sicily and saw Mount Etna, another volcano that erupted a few days after we left. When we were in Venice, we had a view of the famous St. Mark's Square underwater. It had been raining for days and the huge square was flooded. So much so the city had placed wooden boardwalks to enable people to cross the square from one end to the other. We found ourselves stuck with nowhere to go in the pouring rain and with the added urgency of finding a washroom. We could find no public toilets and the fashionable shops that lined the public library and uh, I'm sorry, that lines the sides, the two sides of St. Mark's Square were not the answer. They would not even let you in. In desperation, we entered the public library and we were refused entry because we were not members. So we approached the front desk, filled out the forms and enrolled with no fee and received library cards. We entered and use their facilities, reading and otherwise. And so we're back home. I witnessed this beautiful sunrise on Lake Ontario from my daughter's home in, on, in Toronto. It really is a wonderful world. Thank you for accompanying me on this trip. Thank you, Carly, for your help and support. Thanks also to my cyber seniors tutor, Kevin. Happy trails, everyone.